Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie O'Leary. And special guest today is Zach, who is the host of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. Zach, thanks so much for joining us and talking ball. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, we'll get into this full matchup and everything uh, going into Saturday's game. But first, uh, this podcast is presented to you by Night and Day Apparel. Get ready for the tailgating season with night and day apparel. Our apparel is designed to keep you comfortable and stylish from the pregame excitement to the final whistle. Whether you're grilling in the parking lot or cheering from the stands, our high quality gear has you covered with unbeatable comfort and team spirit. Use our promo code Rutgers Rivals to get 10% off your purchase. Score big this season and keep shopping with night and day apparel. We are also brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one resource for football. Bet Online is every stat, matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during games. If you think you know your stuff, get in on our $200,000 mega contest and pick five games against the spread each week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of our 150 slot games. Head to the website today and get on the action. Bet Online, the game starts here. So Zach, let's start to uh, let's start with this off season because you guys had one of the the weirder situations in college football happen to you, where Chip Kelly decided to leave the program as head coach to become the offensive coordinator at a Big Ten rival or not rival, I guess, but a Big Ten uh, conference foe in Ohio State, and you hired uh, Deshaun Foster, who is a UCLA legend, to coach the program. Obviously, the the viral moment of Big Ten Media Day was his seemingly unprepared speech that he made. Uh, what are the vibes generally around the UCLA program right now and Coach Foster? Yeah, right now, it doesn't seem from the fan base side of things, it's pretty apathetic. It's pretty brutal. Nobody's going to the Rose Bowl. It's, you know, there's more Minnesota fans than there were UCLA fans. It seemed like at times in the Rose Bowl on Saturday. But, you know, the players are still playing hard. They're a little less talented than one would have liked. And, yeah, there's probably certain games that if Chip Kelly was the coach, they would win those games with the same players than if Deshaun Foster and his staff was in place. But there's a reason why Chip left, and there's a reason why Deshaun Foster does things a little bit better in the external aspect as opposed to what's going on on the field for UCLA. It's just you look at it, they've lost four straight ranked opponent games, and they played Minnesota at home, and that was brutal because that was a game they could have and should have won. That's what I think has really sunk the the spirits as low as they've been in a while. Uh, I, I do, before we even touch on the team, I want to talk to you about this travel situation. I mean, UCLA has been <laughs> yeah. literally all across the country, at Hawaii, at LSU, at Penn State, at Rutgers, and then at Nebraska next week. I know Deshaun Foster says it's not a problem, or he said, he said that in his press conference this week, but do you see that as a kind of an issue for this team? I mean, yeah, they probably they'd set the Hawaii and LSU games, you know, before they realized, oh, Big Ten schedule, and then they reset the Big Ten schedule after Washington yeah. And Oregon joined the conference because this obviously wasn't the first iteration. Mm -hmm. So the amount of miles they're flying is ridiculous. And I think, yeah. you know, I've, I've had it pointed out to me, the amount of teams in the Big Ten or maybe just across all these super conferences now of sorts mm -hmm. who are making the longer flights, they're generally winning at a much lower clip, right? Like mm -hmm. Penn State is beating USC the other week. That's a That was a tough win to get across the country. Ohio State going to Oregon, they didn't win. Of course, it's a tough environment. But, of course, everybody coming to UCLA seems to win. The traveling, yes, that's uh, an immense part of this. Mm -hmm. And what it's going to be for the next few years until something changes or it doesn't. And, yeah, it, it does suck to see them have to go across the country in every, mm -hmm. almost every sport every week, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah, the adjustment to uh, from playing Pac-10 ball or Pac-12 ball to Big Ten ball is also big. Do you see that as, like, a, a fundamental issue for the team right now in, in terms of, you know, going against bigger lines, going against tougher defenses than you faced last year? Or do you think it's just the circumstances that, you know, led UCLA into the season weren't the best and they're, they're struggling to adapt to that? I think the big thing is last year, large, same, similar, they had a large sample of the same players, right, playing for this team. Roster somewhat kept intact. Chip Kelly with this offensive line still struggled. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing is this year, new offensive coordinator, similar pieces on the offensive line, and the emphasis on the running game and the design just hasn't been there. You add in the Big Ten trenches where they're just, they just look bigger. They look stronger. Of course, I was hearing that all offseason. I'm like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. <laughs> Hopefully the same guys can play well this year. Well, the same guys who couldn't pass protect Ethan Garbers or former UCLA Bruin Dante Moore are the mm -hmm. same guys who can't protect Ethan Garbers this year. So, And that was in the Pac-12. Now, I think it's a combination of 
They don't have it in the trenches at the moment. Chip Kelly failed and didn't get the right guys. And Deshaun Foster and Eric Bieniemy don't really know how to design the run game, it seems like, to success. And they're still struggling to protect Garbers. So all of it put in together, and they got one of the worst offenses in the country. It's ugly to watch at times. Yeah, I... I... I, I try and like do as deep of a dive as possible to an opponent opposing team and try and like pull out some good and pull out some bad. And th- th- I think this is in part due to how terrible, how terribly difficult your schedule has been. You play currently the number two team in the country in Oregon, the number three team in the country in Penn state, the number eight team in the country in LSU, the number 16 team in the country in Indiana, who nobody expected to be this good this year, <laughs> all in the first six game, but 87th in passing offense, 131st in rushing offense, 100. Fourth in turnovers, 109th in sacks, 116th in ter- third down percentage, 130th in total offense. You, you talked about how the offensive line has been a struggle, but where would you point to the, the, some areas where you guys are performing better than you expected this year? The, well, I, I won't point anywhere towards the offense. We'll, I'll shift my focus. <laughs> Defensively, they are performing much better. This is a team that was led by their defense last year. Like, was one of the best defenses UCLA's ever had. They had Danton Lynn. Of course, he jumps ships, goes to USC. He takes two DBs with him. All the defensive line talent leaves and goes to the NFL or test those waters. So they had, a, you know, a cover, cover that was a little dry this year. New defensive coordinator. And they've performed, you know, you, you talk about the talent they've faced, much better offensive line, solid offenses, and the Bruins have held their own defensively. Now you look at those numbers, you see 34 points, you see a little lack of sacks there. But the defense has been, I think, the bright spot. Offensively, I can't honestly point to anything that has been a bright spot. It's been a disappointment because you bring in the big-name offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy after his year in Washington with the commanders, of course, all that's tied when he walks in with his Kansas City Super Bowl rings, and nothing has been good. Last year's offense was mediocre, good, like Chip Kelly kind of bumped it up. This year it just plummeted with the similar receivers, if not better, these similar running backs, the same starting quarterback, and they just can't pick it up. So that says something about the negativity on one side that's supposed to be leading this team, while the defense has been holding their own against some of the country's best. Kind of sticking with the offense there, I know uh, quarterback play hasn't been phenomenal, and you can blame the offensive line if, if that is the scenario, but I, I thought Justin Martin in his lone start looked pretty solid. Is there is it time to kind of start considering a switch? I mean, I've been a little controversial for some UCLA fans. I've been saying <laughs> I, I think it's Garbers for now. Let's, mm-hmm. let's remind folks, last year UCLA went th- through the same exact thing, different coaching staff. Ethan mm-hmm. Garbers with Colin Schley and Dante Moore. Mm-hmm. Chip Kelly out of camp in 23 said, we don't have a starting quarterback. And we thought he was just playing games with the media. Well, it turned out they kind of didn't until Garbers <laughs> took the job at the end of the year from Dante Moore, who was a true freshman compared to a redshirt mm-hmm. junior. We come to this year, Garbers is the clear cut starter in a very complex offense. There's been quite a few stories, I think, in the LA Times, people covering the team as well beyond me about how the team has struggled to pick up the offense, even leading up to the Indiana game after a bye week, after the Hawaii game, they still went over to Garber's apartment or something. We're trying to figure out the offense, right? Like this is a complicated offense. Mm -hmm. Martin's been there quite a few years. He's not your typical youngster. He's been there in the program three years, I think. So he did look good against Penn State. But in my mind, I think they simplified the offense. He is much more athletic, but he didn't throw the ball down the field like Garber's did against J. Michael Sturdivant and this Minnesota defense last week. But I'm thinking when they play Rutgers this week, you give Garbers a half. If he looks dreadful again, then you pull and bring in Martin. And UCLA does have a bye week coming up. So I think that's the perfect time if Garbers still is sucking or is really not figuring it out or they just need a change in the quarterback room, Mm -hmm. that would be the perfect time to implement somebody new going into a bye week. Yeah. So you talk about the Minnesota game last week. That was clearly the in my opinion, the best game you guys had played in the, the, I didn't watch every single game, but I watched a lot of the, the, the BTN. You didn't 60s. need to. Didn't well, need to. I just, they, UCLA looked significantly better last week. What would you say were some of the things that they did better against Minnesota than they had to previous opponents they faced? I think they did, you know, a lot of things similar to what they do. They get teams into third and long. They were able to stop teams. Minnesota's just not a top 15 team in the country, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. UCLA's got one of the worst third down conversion defenses. They let teams convert a high rate. Minnesota, yes, they beat UCLA, they beat USC, and I don't want to take the props off their win, 
But the things that other teams convert against the Bruins, they just did not. So UCLA sometimes is in the backfield and can almost make a play. Minnesota just isn't the caliber to make some of those plays that other teams do. Obviously, you keep Garbers upright. He was throwing the ball against the defense that picks off quarterbacks left and right. I think they're tied. Minnesota was for the nation's lead in interceptions. And that's what we saw with Garbers at the end of the game with a total of three. And they did little things to get the running game going. It's just not as successful as it, as it has been, right? So you get your quarterback back. He was throwing the ball around. The running game was not as successful as, will, as I would have liked to have seen. But defensively, they made plays. They got some sacks. When was the last time they got multiple sacks in the game? Week one. So they got some pressure. Wow. They inflict a little physicality, but large in part, they kept Garbers upright just enough to keep them competitive. One thing I noticed uh, that jumped out at me statistically that you guys do well is you're 13th in rushing defense. You're allowing only 92 rushing yards per game. Would you attribute that to the teams you've played have been pass happy, or do you guys have the good schemes to stop the run game and worse schemes to stop the pass? They are coming off a year last year where they were really good at stopping the run. This year, I think they have faced some teams that like to throw the ball. They had Nussmeyer who can throw it all over the yard. Against Penn State, they abandoned the run a little early. And then even though they could have gotten five yards per carry, the one team that truly ran the ball in UCLA was Oregon. And they like to throw the ball a lot. They like to run the ball mm -hmm. a lot. But so far, when you watch the games closely, you can see the line gets dominant. They can make plays to stop the run. They're trying to cycle in multiple guys in the D-line that have either not gotten a lot of time at UCLA or don't have experience on the D-line necessarily. Cal transfer Femi Oladejo is one of those guys who's growing into his role for UCLA. Mm -hmm. So I would think it's not exactly fool's gold if you look at the yards per carry, but when they face like an Oregon or if teams really wanted to pound the rock on them, they probably could it just makes this Rutgers matchup so fascinating because if UCLA holds up on the rushing side of things, on the defensive side, stopping the run, it could be a good day for UCLA. I'm just not sure where that's going to fall this weekend. Yeah, it's it's interesting because just looking at the games too, I mean, is it just – they've performed better, it seems like, almost each week in, in UCLA. Now, do you feel it's just more of them grasping the coaching staff, the coaching styles, the playbook more like you mentioned they were struggling with that? Or is it just a matter of lesser ranked teams, too, on top of that? I mean, it's tough, right? Because you start off with a Hawaii team they're supposed to blow out. Of course, week one, yeah. weird things can happen, and it almost did. They did. But it also showcased that they're probably not as good as we all hoped they could have been, at least on the UCLA side of thing. Yeah. Then Indiana comes out of nowhere, punches them in the mouth, and they did mm -hmm. that to five other opponents so far, yeah. six other opponents. And then they, you know, they slowly get better. That's the hope, right? They mm -hmm. show incremental improvements. But I think the biggest telling thing about this team is they've not played four quarters. You can play mm -hmm. a solid four-quarter game and lose. UCLA just has not done that to this point in this season. And there mm -hmm. have been improvements. Deshaun Foster wants to promote that in the post game, But there's clearly a talent deficit. There's a lot of things they don't do right offensively and they just miss some big plays to force losses on the defensive side of things that whenever they take a step back, it feels like a step forward. I should say they take two steps backward and it, it just kind of, it hurts the soul. If you're watching it just from like, oh, you don't want them to be that bad. The new team in the big 10, at least mm -hmm. punch upwards, but it, it's, it's frustrating. They have shown improvements, but the Minnesota game was a clear, the opponent is here and the rest of the opponents have been here. So yeah. I think that's where it is. And Minnesota is not a bad ball club. They're coached well. They play clean football. And mm -hmm. that's really what won in the game. So Rutgers had a catastrophic loss last week. Not that the losing to Wisconsin is something that's catastrophic. Just the way that they mm -hmm. lost. It was never competitive at home. They lost 42 to 7 in a game mm -hmm. that they were favored in coming into it. That's coming off a backbreaking loss against uh, Nebraska. If UCLA was to win this game, how do you see the game script playing out uh, on Saturday? I would think largely UCLA avoids the turnover. Every game that Ethan Garbers has started, if, unless they make a last minute switch and they've been a little mum on that, but I think it's Garbers team for now. Mm -hmm. He's turned it over two or more times every game he's played two wow. or more times, including a pick, including a fumble, maybe dropping it. I know against Minnesota, there was a tip and a Hail Mary added into those numbers, but that did change the complexion of the game when UCLA could have been up two scores early against Rutgers. 
what UCLA needs to do, go up early. They have to score first. The Minnesota game for the Bruins was the first time all season they led after the opening drive. They've been trailing almost after every opening drive this season. So they got a lead. They can't throw three interceptions and expect to win on the road across the country. And then for the defense, they have to live up to those rushing numbers defensively. Like this is a true, can you handle the physicality on the road after a disappointing loss? Because let's face it, you lose in the last 30 seconds in a game you probably and could have, should have won. Is that team not going to show up next week? That's easy to be deflated on a five, six hour flight across the country and just not want to be there. So that's all that we're going to know in the first quarter, if they want to be there or if they don't care. All those things together, I think, could result in a UCLA victory. Clean football, which they have not played. Yeah, You said this UCLA offense is trying to be run-oriented or run-first, yet the, obviously the rushing numbers are bad. Is, there, is it time for a switch there as well? I know Jalen Berger, uh, Rutgers fans, are very familiar with as a Kyle guy's teammate, top four or top ten recruit in New Jersey, blah, 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 all that other stuff. He, it seems like his numbers are better overall. They're not great. Yeah, but they're I better. think the biggest uh, thing is I do think this year's offense is a little more pass oriented, though, switching from okay. Chip Kelly to Eric Bienemy, his West Coast offense. You look at mm-hmm. Eric Bienemy's numbers with the commanders, mm-hmm. their yards per carry weren't bad, but they also rushed the football the least last year, right? It, in the NFL with Bienemy, one of the f- teams with the fewest rushing attempts. So he likes to throw the football. That could be attributed to a team that was losing a lot of games, whatever, but clearly they did not run the football. That same emphasis, or lack thereof, running the football has translated to a UCLA team that's returning their leading rusher or close thereof with TJ Harden. Mm-hmm. Berger's been nice. And then Keegan Jones is a nice returner. UCLA got back from the portal, who is very dynamic and quick and speedy. They try to be physical, but I just think it's just the design because they're not as strong up front. And with a similar offensive line and running back last year, they would get run. They'd get yards with Carson Steele, who was starting with the Chiefs a couple weeks ago, right? You mix mm-hmm. that with Harden. These same guys were doing things, and this mm-hmm. year they're not. So I'm not sure. I do like Berger running the football. He does get quite a few yards per carry, mm-hmm. but I don't think it matters who you throw back there. If they're getting met in the line of, behind the line of scrimmage three yards every time he gets the football, that isn't going to lead to success, regardless of who's running the football, right? There even. Boise State's running back wouldn't be running for 200 yards behind this <laughs> offensive line. That's not going to happen. That's where UCLA is not being able to run the football. It's a, it's a bold take, man. He's pretty good. <laughs> I, it, it, I don't think it's that bold. I know, <laughs> I know. He would not be able to behind this offensive line. Yeah, I, know. I, got, I got what you mean. Yeah, so I think, I think this is going to be an interesting battle amongst two teams that have had a lot of struggles. Despite Rutgers' 4-2 <laughs> and two record, they have not been able to stop the run this year. I don't know where they currently rank, but... They got gashed by Washington's mm-hmm. uh, running back in uh, Jonah Coleman. They got gashed by uh, Bashal Tutin from Virginia Tech. They got gashed basically against everybody. So I think that's another key is Ken Rutgers win at the line of scrimmage on both sides because against Nebraska was the only game this whole season where I thought they outperformed uh, an opponent's offensive line in terms of on defense. So um, it's – a, a good thing for me as a Rutgers fan that you're saying how bad the offensive line is. I'll kind of mm-hmm. believe it before I see it after last week. Um, yeah. Is there anything that we haven't asked you about that you think is going to be important, either a player or a, a specific wrinkle about this team right now in UCLA that Rutgers fans should be aware of? I think you're going to laugh at me, but <laughs> I think if UCLA has to punt the ball and pin it deep, Brody Richter has been pinning teams inside the 10 pretty regularly. I remember going to the LSU game, and I think some of the LSU fans were very impressed, not by the UCLA team as a whole. It was the punter who pinned them inside the 10 two or three times in that game. LSU still went 90 plus yards for two scores after that. Mm -hmm. But if this comes into a field position game, and the defense is playing well for UCLA, look for like Brody Richter to go in there and drop a punt or two inside the 10 or the 15 yard line if that's what the game's going to come down to right because this is if you look at the odds it's within a one score game it's fluctuating back and forth before game day look for him and then a former walk on Carson Swessinger he's a guy that's come out leads the Big Ten in tackles you think why would I be pointing out the guy Big Ten tackle who leads the conference in tackles as an underrated player because he is like this is another year for UCLA where kids come out of nowhere and dominated look for those two guys and obviously the big all the eyes will be on who will be in quarterback for UCLA for the whole game? Is there going to be a switch? We'll find out. 
I think those are the big things to look for for the Bruins. I find that funny about the punting thing because I, I don't know if you know this. I mean, Rutgers is well known for punting more than anyone. <laughs> Ray Guy Award winner in 2022, Ray Guy Award finalist in 2021, finalist in 2020. Like Adam Korsak was a god. I remember so I, a I lot of punters. I remember a lot of Iowa fans. I think one year, um, mm-hmm. really just being like, I can't believe how good your punter is because they also <laughs> had Tory Taylor at the time, and it yeah. was just like a battle of the punters. I think we pinned them down in the five multiple times, and it was just like. Mm-hmm. It's like the ultimate show of like the opposing team's fan apathy. It's like, man, y'all didn't play well, but that punter, man, holy <laughs> cow, he can really <laughs> spin that thing. Um, so we've talked about a lot here. Let's get down to some predictions. Like you said, the the line opened up at six and a half, favoring Rutgers. It's now down to four and a half, I believe, favoring mm-hmm. Rutgers. What's your prediction on how this game actually plays out? If the Rutgers game wasn't directly after the Minnesota game, I would be thinking UCLA has a, a not a good chance, but a solid chance at winning. Doesn't mean that they should be favored, but it'd be more of a 50 50 toss up. Mm-hmm. I just wonder what the heart of this team looks like after a devastating loss with all the punches they've taken from the travel, from the, the tough schedule, from just the sheer lack of success and clearly lack of coaching the Bruins kind of have showcased on the field. UCLA has a chance to win this game. I just think after the Minnesota game, it might be Rutgers by 10. It could be UCLA by 10, but I would lean Rutgers by 10 in a close game that they pull away a little bit later, pull away winning by 10. You know, that's not like a big thing, but for UCLA's offense, when you average 14 and a half points per game, that's like 21 points for them. They can't overcome a two score deficit. (laughs) I think Rutgers win this game by two scores, a close two scores. And I think UCLA just can't motivate themselves after an emotional loss to Minnesota. How about you, Rich? How do you see this game playing out? I mean, you mentioned it before, and I know Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports tweeted it out this week. Big 10 teams that cross two time zones are 3-10 and 10 this year. Two of those games, obviously, against UCLA, Indiana, and Minnesota. Two of those games happened last week in Minnesota and Penn State USC. I just, between the time zone difference, between – Rutgers trying to bounce back between UCLA struggling on offense. I know Rutgers notoriously struggles against backup quarterbacks, so that that part kind of worries me a little bit. If Justin Martin comes in. I saw him two weeks ago. I watched that whole game against Penn State. He looked pretty solid. I was like, oh, shit, like, this guy might be a problem. Um, but, no, I, I think Rutgers is going to bounce back this week. I think that their rushing attack is going to be able to put up some solid yardage. I think they'll make some switches on offense to get Ethan Kelly McManus going. And I want to say 24 24- 14. I don't think it's going to be pretty by any means. I don't think any Rutgers game is going to be pretty at this point. So uh, I think it's all just going to be ugly, old school, boring Big Ten football, and it's going to be 90 minutes of pain, basically. <laughs> I, I think you nailed it, Zach, that we're going to know the, how the winds are blowing in this game in the first quarter. If Rutgers continues its struggles early on offense, especially, they're going to let you guys stay in the game for a long time, and it's going to come down to like, who can like make fewer mistakes because Rutgers has shot themselves in the foot so many times in the Nebraska game alone, our first Mm -hmm. nine drives all made it into Nebraska territory, zero points. (laughs) Uh, Just like a carcaphony or however you say that of just mismanagement in terms of play calling in terms of just not converting. So if we cannot, if that's, if that's the Rutgers team that shows up on Saturday, especially how we played on last Saturday, I just can't imagine them winning this game period. Now, if they come in and actually play like they want to be there, play like they've got a renewed fire underneath them, I think they could win by two scores. But I just have a hard time seeing Rutgers really hitting on all cylinders, regardless of the opponent right now. So I'm going to say Rutgers wins, but in like a squeaker, like three points, maybe something like, I don't know. I know this is not three points, but 21-17. Like, I think it's going to be ugly. I think Rutgers is going to fail to take advantage of turnovers that you give to us unless it's a pick six. Because we've had, you know, we had a punt block against Nebraska that we returned to the two yard line, and we had six chances from the two or further in, and we didn't score. So that's just kind of like an idea of like how bad the offense has been and how bad the play calling has been the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's just me using uh, a small sample size or like recency bias, but I just really have a hard time seeing Rutgers like really amp themselves up, especially with all the injuries we're also dealing with. Um, But. We thank you for coming on here, Zach. Let's talk a little bit about NIL and how that's affecting uh, UCLA, Athle- UCLA Athletics. Um, I know you guys are typically known for being a basketball program. 
but how how is the the NIL world or has the NIL scene at, at uh, UCLA right now? And are fans kind of up in arms about it, or are they they're they happy with the, the new reality we're in? Well, you, you chose a good week to ask the question. They literally just yeah. ushered out. They just brought out a whole new umbrella. <clears throat> they just announced this UCLA Athletics early in the week. The champion of Westwood, which used to be, I think, called the champions of Westwood, which supported more the women's and, Olymp- and Olympic sports. So they're kind of all separate. Like, oh, I want to support the football team. I want to support men's basketball, right? And they had different types of umbrellas. Now they brought it all under one umbrella called the champion of Westwood. Men's basketball has their own NIL like branch. The women's sports and the Olympic sports have another branch. And then football specifically has this new branch, which is called the Bruins for Life. And I know Rutgers fans are totally going to care about it. But UCLA just brought out this whole new thing where they're trying to make it work, right? A public UC school in the state of California, how are they going to compete with the rest of the Big Ten, the SECs, the private schools, right? Because USC is a private the, the Nike money of Oregon in the NIL mm-hmm. world. Basketball, Mick Cronin, he complained, he moaned and said, we don't got it. And he went out and got it. Like if you're watching basketball this year, UCLA mm-hmm. Rutgers, that will be intense. UCLA is going to be fun. very good at basketball. Like if we yeah. talk basketball, UCLA, I'm very confident, over cocky, overconfident for that. <laughs> Football wise, <laughs> they're trying to generate the money and the revenue. But when nobody's going to the games, Besides, like myself, you know, when nobody has the the energy anymore, right? It was all energetic early. Chip Kelly's out because UCLA fans hated Chip Kelly for a long time, a long, long time, and the attendance hasn't changed. The play hasn't necessarily improved on the field. I'm not sure the NIL is there, but when UCLA was trying to keep their biggest defensive tackle, Jay Tawia, from entering the portal and going to Texas, an NIL war. Although an LA Times story came out this morning about this about he didn't necessarily want to be bought by money, I think was a quote, a snippet of a quote from that story. Mm. UCLA was able to keep a guy from going to Texas, who's number one in the country, and keep him among the worst teams in the country, right? (laughs) That speaks to what they have in the locker room, and I think what fans are missing as to what the support is. Because it's not there football-wise, but they're trying to generate something with this new NAL branch thing where football directly needs its own funding, and so does basketball. I mean, Foster said following practice on Wednesday that they uh, got a million dollars already. So that's a hell of a start. It does. It does. But, you know, I think Ohio State's, what, the $20 million roster? They need another 19. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. It's, it's definitely a haves and the haves-nots in this conference for sure. Hopefully we can mm-hmm. both get a little closer to the haves and the have-nots as things go on. Um, but thanks again for joining us, Zach. Tell us, uh, tell us and everybody who's listening where we could find you on social media and where we could find your work. Yeah, so I do the Locked On UCLA podcast. It's anywhere you find your podcast audio-wise. That's on YouTube. I have my Zach and Yox Twitter, at Zach underscore and, the word and, and Yox, because my name's so long, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. I also have the Locked On Bruins Twitter X account. You know, you might not see me the most, you know, engaging on social media presence. I'll see there. I see it. I read it. And then I speak it. So if you're going to listen or talk to me, you'll probably have to engage with me on YouTube mostly or listening to the podcast because I will let my feelings known after the game. Like they're very emotion heavy and there's been a lot of emotions. I just need people to, you know, come watch and join with me in the sorrows of football season. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks to everybody who's listened. Um, We're not going to talk about the the giveaway this this pod. We'll talk about it tomorrow. But for me and Rich and Zach, this has been another edition of the Net Report Podcast signing off. You probably thought that was the end of the podcast, right? Well, no. One more thing. Forgot to add this at the end. I'm going to send it over real quick to uh, meteorologist and Rutgers alumni Joe Martucci for the upcoming weather report for this Saturday afternoon's 12 p.m. kickoff against UCLA. Joe? It's homecoming weekend for Rutgers, and that means our Rutgers football game is happening this Saturday. And while we're playing UCLA, I'll tell you what, our football weather will be feeling more like L.A. rather than New Jersey. It's meteorologist Joe Martucci here, Rutgers alum, Rutgers football season ticket holder. Good to be with you. I went back in the data over the past couple of years, and when it comes to homecoming, most of them have been dry here. In fact, the only one with rain was last year against Michigan State, where we won in dramatic fashion in the rain. I was there through about the third quarter, and then we made our way back, and while we were driving, we heard that comeback on the radio. Maybe we should have stayed out in the rain. But all in all, temperatures have been generally in the 60s for homecoming. 
and it has been dry. And we're going to see both of those sunshine, dry weather, and temperatures in the 60s for our homecoming game. Now, if you're getting out there early to tailgate, a little bit of a chill in the air, starting out only in the mid-40s, and then we'll get to 60 degrees by 11 o'clock. It's pretty similar to last Saturday, where you probably want that sweatshirt to start, and then you could take it off as we get closer to game time here. Winds from the north at about five miles an hour during the morning. Then as we go into game time itself, plenty of sunshine to go around. I don't even think you'll see a cloud in the sky here. Winds coming from the northeast at about five miles an hour. This is going to be a little bit cooler than where we were last Saturday, but still very comfortable for our Rutgers football game. And hopefully we come away with that win against UCLA. Starting next Tuesday, you can enter to win two tickets in one parking spot in my Rutgers Red Zone giveaway here for the Minnesota game on November the 9th. Big congrats to Jennifer from Sayreville who won two tickets in parking for this week's matchup against UCLA. You can enter on my social media and follow me for all things Jersey weather at Joe Mart WX.